the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come today to think about, to study, and to converse about, about your servant Moses in the Old Testament. Help us through this conversation to know you better, to understand your will, to draw closer to you. We entrust this time and this conversation to, the ha- to, to your hands, to the hands and the will of our blessed Father as we pray. Hail Mary, Amen. full of Lord grace, Christ, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, most of that's part two. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 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 well. Not just really dangerous. It's like the, the couple of things that, because it was, you know, the extemporaneous conversation, um, I'm going to finish a couple of things out of that. And hopefully they will answer some more questions and there was some confusion about something like I said. Hopefully they will answer those questions. So they can go on to the rest of the um, things. But no, obviously there are questions better that they're asked. And I'm sure if you have them, someone else has them as well. You don't ever be worried about it. Even if you go off that tangent, you don't cover very far. I'll take that out Because I have a question right now for later. <laughs> okay. It's not just that we had to cover a certain amount by a certain time. It's just, okay. you know, there's. That's not like you're in class when we tested until the end of April or something. Yes, you want me to do tests. I've always came. Are we just doing the Old Testament or the whole Bible? <laughs> um, probably just the Old Testament. Okay. Um, but I was just mean, wondering how many years. Rest of your life. So, one thing I want to make clear is that discussing the worship of God, discussing how you come to God and worship God in those different kinds of masses, as we're talking about the cat. God's desire and God's plan for the Mass is arbitrary. So worship isn't arbitrary. So it, it is very true. We, I mean, obviously, we have to, we want to do what the Lord wants. We want to worship and set up the Mass the way God set up, obviously. But why does God set up a so Why does God set up a God? Is it possible to have that mass world where we're doing it kind of different? And the answer is no. And the reason why it should be done a certain way is simply be by based upon God's will. Not based upon simply based upon God. Obviously, God has will. It's not based only upon God's will. In the sense that there are certain people, certain philosophies, certain ideas, even certain faiths. I believe in an idea that's basically it's called, very broadly speaking, voluntarism. Not volunteerism, voluntarism. Which means everything is based solely upon the will. And so a radical form of this would be saying that God could decide tomorrow that murders were paid. Or God could say, you know, Fred, if everybody else murders wrong for you, you can mind and cheat and steal a murder and feel these happy that that's good for you. Because right and wrong, good and bad, is simply based upon God's will, which can change. Um, it can't change. It can't. This is a false idea. Bad idea. <laughs> but if this were, were, were the case, were, were it to change, it's just a, a sort of philosophy, false philosophy. God would say to one person, you can murder, you can shoot, you can steal, you can lie, no one else can, you can. <clears throat> this is how certain people get around God's law. They'll say, listen, this is good for me, not good for you. God, God reveals to me that I am called to have 12 wives. Not the rest of you, but I am called to have 12 wives. This is based upon volunteers. But even God's worship can't be like this either. Judas is God here. Isn't that, wasn't that God's will that he, you know, betrayed Christ so that the prophet, so the prophecy would be. So God's will is always the main fault. But God's will 
Let me ask this question from Leah first. Let's see if I can answer your question. Okay. Um, it's not that God does not go for him, of course God will go for us. But what we would say is rather than being based upon God's will, or the way we understand a human will, it's based upon God's nature. So good and bad, yes, of course God wills for us. Of course God wills what's right. And of course we want to imitate and follow God's will. God does will what's good. But God's will is an arbitrary, changeable thing. God's will is God's nature. And so God's will can never change, because God can't change. Right and wrong will never change, because God's nature will never change. Um, and so God can't tomorrow say, murder's bad, stealing's okay, or that for you, murder's okay, or for you, stealing's okay, or lying's okay. Because these things aren't based upon simply a changeable will. So not a changeable will. Not a changeable decision. But they're based upon God's nature. Who God is, how he is what is. And they're meant to, and so the the fact that God's will God is purely simple. God is um, God has no parts, no visible. God can't be affected with it. It's simple, the Italian philosophy, the nature of God. <laughs> um, God is different than the rest of creation. So you and I, we have a freedom. You and I openly have goodness, have truth. God is truth. God is his will. And God, his will is different than his, not different than his nature. God's will is his nature. And so we, we give different words to these things to help us understand it better because our, our, our minds are limited. And it's easier for us to, to say, uh, look at God's will, look at, but it simply is the end of God himself. So because God's nature can't change, either can God's will. And so yes, the law is referencing God's will, but it really is the end of God's nature. And this is why following the law is following God's nature, following God himself, becoming like God. Not simply an arbitrary, changeable thing. But the same is true for worship. When God is that his worship, what, what does God do? He's not simply saying, saying arbitrarily, I'm going to have sacrifice, I'm going to have these things, I'm going to have that thing. What he's doing is he's drawing us into his divine life. Creatures, human beings, persons meant for God, God's goal for us, desire for us, will for us, his plan for our creation is to draw us into his own divine nature, draw us into his own life, make us his children, make us like himself. And so the worship he gives us is arbitrary, but it's designed to draw us into his own life. And so the reason why he said it the way it is, the reason why God has suffered the the reason why God established it, first of all, the testament. With the temple sacrifices, then perfected it in the last supper of the mass. And this is designed, and of course, the cross, this is the same sacrifice. This is designed by God to draw us into his own divine mind. How does this do this? How does the mass do that? Well, God's divine life in heaven, not his work here on earth, mission on earth, but God's divine life in heaven, what's that consist of? To put it very simply, and even this is even that simple because it's God. It's very simple. Um, the Father looks at the Son and loves the Son. The other Son loves the Son. And the Son knows the Father and loves the Father. And the Father and the Son know of each other and as the Holy Spirit. By the Father's knowledge is the Son, the Father and the Son love each other, and that love is the Holy Spirit. That's the divine life. And so she worship, adoration, <coughs> is going to be a sharing. 
and lead us into heaven where we live that. So the reason why the Mass is the way it is, the reason why it's the way it is, isn't an arbitrary thing to the midnight, but it's designed to draw us into this worship and love. Worship isn't simply God, God wanting us to, to, to honor us, God being saying, you know, look how wonderful I am, and please tell me I'm great I am. <laughs> it's God saying, I want you to, to love me, and I to love you, and have this union together, a friendship and love, which is a a glimpse, an image, a sharer in the triune life. It's the beginning of that, entering into this heaven itself. And so the reason why the Mass is be a certain way, or a certain way, it can't be on our ways. It can't be a struggle with us, it can't be given with us, it can't point to us. The reason why it's false worship do be a certain way isn't simply because God said so. Because it's God's nature, because of nature, that's why God says so. Right? So God does say these things. He says these things because the purpose is to lead back to us, draw us into his life, make us like himself, to give us this lips of heaven and eternity. So it begins with who God is. We get drawn into this. Um, and so God that's why the Lord gives us these things and helps do these things in this way. Make sense? Work with it? Did that answer your question? Yes, uh, well, this is mostly about the mass, right? Okay. It might draw the sound, but the volunteerism yeah. that, you know, um, we have the choice to make those choices, but God gives us that knowledge to make those choices, mm -hmm. right? Like he did with Judas. He was, it was already prophesied that he was going to be, and then he also says that he was like stealing money from the mm -hmm. bank and all that, you know. Um, how is that part of being closer to God when he was walking with God? Right. My son, right? When he was right. walking with Jesus, he was with him. How could that even come into play of him wanting to do that, you know, against Jesus and the apostles and stuff? So God never will sin, period. Uh, God did not want Judas to sin, to fall, to betray him, to steal. And he always called Jesus back for him. But God loved Judas and chose him to be a the apostle, even though he knew he was going to reject that. Because his love was greater than Judas' hatred. Um, and part of the mystery of evil is that God does not reject us, we reject him. And so God's not going to offer love and offer you this choice, offer you these gifts, and let you come to even though you're going to reject those gifts. Right, you and I, as far as we're limited, but I've lost partially because of your ears. You know, if you know someone's not going to accept a kid, they're not going to say, fine. You know, don't want my help. I want an offer. Yeah. It's not who God is. God is there saying to us, I'm always here. I'm always going to offer to you, even though I know you're not going to accept it. Because any rejection, any distance between us, never comes from Him, it always comes from us. And so God never wanted Judas to sin. Never wanted Judas to fall. Never wanted that to be fall. But He used their fall. He uses our sin. He uses our deeper wickedness to bring about good. So God wills the good that He brings about. That wills the evil that we, that we do. I have a question. Um, I've been reading some older literature what is the difference between Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit? Why was it changed from Holy Ghost to Holy Spirit? It's not a change, it's a difference in language. <laughs> um, is, it, is it different? No. Um, it's a different emphasis. Um, and so Holy Ghost reflects the Germanic roots of the English language. Holy Spirit reflects the Latin. Okay, that's um, perfect. <sighs> Um, spirit, in some ways, is the problem with ghosts. In why I think it's become less common mm -hmm. is because is that in the, in the modern English, ghost refers to a partial person, the person not alive. Um, and so we think you're ghost, and we think that person, but this is a But we say evil spirits. 
So you do. Yeah. But, but remember, the, the spirits don't have bodies. Oh, they don't have bodies. Um, I mean, the, the are really machine is really no difference. I just but, wondered why yeah. there was because I was reading some old prayers and things, right. and it always said Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right. And it would refer to the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. and stuff like that instead of the Holy Spirit. So that answered me. Yeah, so your Germanic root as opposed to Latin root. Okay. Um, both ha have reasons to recommend them, but they're really the same. Um, um, some people like Holy Ghost. Certainly, there's a tradition there of that their uh, spirit is too vague. Sometimes, uh, but on but the other hand, those two be in our heart anyway. Yeah, so. but interchangeable words. The second, so let me put before the one. Is that clear about worship? Why not? It was not number one. The second thing that I want, want to say, um, to wrap up the other thing, is we certainly can prefer. Different things. <laughs> so it, it's not that we can't, you know, like a different priest or different way of doing things, or that there's not differences. But it's that my choice for why I serve God, love God, worship God can't begin there. I can't start by saying I'm going to look first what I prefer and then choose the kind of mass. We want to begin by what's true. What is God's will? What will help me imitate, follow him, and the worship? You begin here. Now, after that, yeah, we're going to prefer different things. Uh, and hopefully, what you prefer and like and do enjoy is going to be God's will. Hopefully these aren't different things. Um, so it's not that, that I mean, yes, you know, we're going to have different people we like, different style of preaching we like, different priests, different masses, of course. Um, but that it can't be why I choose. It's not that you can't like or, or have different response to things. It's that the reason for choosing can't be based simply upon, can't start, can't start. It should start here. And if it starts there and then after that, you prefer, enjoy, yeah, fine, whatever. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions on this? <coughs> okay. Let's get back to the bonus step. <laughs> so, as we were discussing last time, Moses goes up the mountain, and you have, and walks up the mountain, and the people then go to the cat. And there's three problems there. And the first problem is that it's idle for some people. The second problem is trying to bring out get down to level of control. The third problem is that it's human beings deciding that how they want to be the arbiters of how to worship God. Which again, we can't do because what we cross into God's life becomes from us. It draws back to our, our own life. So that's where the problem comes, these two problems. Moses, of course, is not happy with this. <laughs> Moses comes down the mountain and in his anger and his, his shock, he breaks the Ten Commandments. He breaks the tablets of the law. Because what he's saying, you know, it was actually he's saying, you broke the law. You broke your promise to God. You have chosen against God. And then he takes the calf and he melts in the fire, grinds with powder, and makes the meat. <laughs> no. He's saying that very Explicit, traditional way, this is not that. This is not a God that has no power. And not only that, we're going to so uh, despise this, it's going to call one end and pass out the other. It was based on what he said. This is, <laughs> this is less than nothing. And your way of treating God and treating this object is less than nothing. It's extra, literally, what he said. Um, and then, and I believe this comes down to your question here, um, 
There is the call of the elders, Exodus chapter 25, 32 and 39. Part of the anger is there is an immediate punishment. And he says, let those who reject this calf come to me and stand up. And the entire tribe of Levi comes and stands the most. Not everyone else. If people walk away, okay, whatever. You know what? Like, again, it's one of those, those things which you both understand because human beings, because it's the way we are. You don't understand because they've seen all these, they've seen the miracles, they've seen what God's done out, and they were looking at us all this way. He says the tribe of Levi he says, You go and those who rejected God, strike them down. Have no pity on them, strike them down. And 3,000 men. And this becomes the call of the Lord. Before we get that, though, let's. Um, Damien asked last time, we were really did, how is it that 3,000 are killed? Some people think it off, some people think they got a plague, some people think they got stopped through an Aaron. You know, why is Aaron chastised? Well, I mean, Aaron must have a conversation. Well, this is to me, Aaron makes some kind of an excuse, you know, I threw it in the fire, and I came to staff, and, you know, don't be mad at me, it was my fault. <laughs> Um, but why is it there these degrees of punishments? The rabbis say that there's going to be a punishment because it's a different attitude of the heart. They say Aaron was trying to worship God, was trying to calm down this, this idolatry. They say first Aaron, so the theory is that first Aaron was trying this, he said, give us the gold. So when they would back off and say, let's wait a few days. And then he was trying to say, let's bring it back and worship God. You know, this is God's case. It's a little problem because he was stabbing his own energy rather than waiting for God's battle. But he was trying to get back to God. Other people were trying to worship God but doing it the wrong way. So they weren't concerned with God's honor and glory, but at least we're still concerned about God. The people who are killed outright are those who reject God. Who in covenant with him broke it deny God, are truly certain false gods. They're the ones with the sword. And remember, we talked about that months ago. The reason why there's a very harsh punishment, even at this moment, there's still a chance to repent. There's still a way to repent. I mean, first Moses told the Levites. Then he says, attack those who reject God. You had a chance to say, you know what, in your mind, or I'm sorry, or help me, or forgive me. They don't. Right? So this is, this is more than just late for you. I don't care how sorry you are. I'm going to get you. You know, these are people who are so set in their ways, they just have thought care. And unfortunately, again, it's a human condition. We get that way. But this becomes the call of Levites. The Levites at this point, this moment, become set aside to serve God. The tribe of Levi now becomes the three orders, the three orders of the priests, the Jewish people, where their portion, their inheritance, their lot isn't the land anymore. But now it's the temple and God himself. And in fact, it goes a little deeper than that. The Levites, the Levites themselves are described as God. And so what's said in the scriptures is God is their portion, their inheritance, their share in, in, in the old covenant. And they are gods. They belong to God in a unique way. And the tribe of Levite, there are three words. Three ranks. The lowest rank are simply called Levites. Basically, you would think of these as deacons in his day's terms. Uh, they would prepare the sacrifices, often the one from the actual slaughtering. They would help the priests do the rhetoric. They would, would perhaps they walk the feet of the priests before the offering of the sacrifice, something Christ does at the Last Supper to 
of the apostles, the sound of their preaching, they would sing at the services. Um, they were known for their singing voices. Levites. Um, above that are the Kohath priests. These are the ones who offer the main sacrifices of various kinds, whether it's oil, whether it's bread, whether it's incense, whether it's the actual lambs and the calves and goats. Um, offered for all reasons, for all for reasons of, prayer, of adoration, of thanksgiving, sorrow, and um, so okay, thank you. Um, and then you have the high priests. Kohen Gadol. So I'll translate big priest, but normally we have that <laughs> Which at that time was Aaron, correct? That time was Aaron, yeah. G -A -D -O Sorry. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest. And so one man was the high priest, one family were the high priests, and one tribe of the Levites. So out of the Levites, one family, only one family would be priests. And out of them, only one man to the high priest. Supposed to be for life, but there is some playing with that at the time of Christ. Uh, so you see that there's high priest for a year, which is not all the law. Different story. Uh, this becomes their call. That because they have come to God, are willing to cast aside everything else and serve God, they're given this call. Now, but notice they too. We're doing the right thing. It wasn't like they were saying, I decided, I didn't say, Lord, no, don't do this horrible thing. They were also going to God. When they see their sin, they repent, and come to God with them. Other people go. So this is what they're called. At this point, Moses prays for the people who has asked mercy on them, and God responds. Then it goes up back to the mountain, and he gives Moses again the words of the covenant. Um, and establishes more detail the sanctuary and the tabernacle and the priests and the way to celebrate the priests. So from the golden calf, we have a couple different lessons. And first of all, we have a lesson of put God first, worship God his way. We also have the lesson of um, those who are meant to serve God have a special zeal. The thing is, in God's original plan, every human being was meant to be a kind of priest. When Adam in the garden was the high priest of creation, and to take creation, give it to God, honor God, love God, serve God, dedicate to God's honor, use it to glorify God and to bring people to him. There wasn't supposed to be any distinction between tribe and nation and people and family, just everyone. It's only because of our sin that one family is called. In the New Testament, it gets opened up to everybody. Now there's still a that's not really what happens. Um, so, but there is now, it's open to everybody, at least the his own priesthood, and then of course every tribe and nation, even the Gentiles, the pagans, now come to worship God and follow God and serve God the priests. And so God then therefore gives everybody the share of the inheritance. God calls all people to serve the inheritance, but all people have it himself be their law, their portion of God. Um, and so we see here again, God, God is stopping the damage beginning with one particular place and then building on. So, so God's plan now is the sacraments we can always are called worship God to serve God to do They're not. So we're all called to be priest, prophet, and kings? All called to be priest, prophet, and king, but they're all over. So there still is different ranks. There's that baptismal priesthood, by which is uh, you, are, you give God your life, first of all, but also your work, your prayer, all the time, of course, the mass. Everything we do has to be done to him, the mass tonight, the mass is brought to Christ's side. But it happens to be baptism. 
And there was the, the ministerial priesthood in which you offer the great right sacrifice and allow a field priesthood to have the meaning that it does. Uh, so it's a different ranks there. Even there, there's deacon, priest, and bishop. Uh, so a different rank, but still everybody has to call the priest from the king. Yeah, because the king is, uh, is the servant to their people. Servant to the people and also control the work one's own self. Right. Uh, so the different members that one has shall be in rebellion against God. They should be under the authority and power and control of a leader and ruler bringing yourself to God. Yeah. So priest offering, a king leading and guiding and ruling, servant, and then prophet speaking to God about God and proclaiming the truth of God. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. We'll go off it. Um, <laughs> I wear so many different letters I can't tell. Is it too warm in here? Okay. If it gets too warm, let me know. We can change that for sure. But I can never tell. Is it too warm? Um, I'm okay. But just, I know sometimes in there, like things get really high and really low, and it's hard to adjust. But I can do it now. I can take, but I can for good reason. I can turn the fingers on. So, okay. There we go. Question any of this? Yeah, it's still question here. Please. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get my head around this. Yes, yes. Without Aaron, there's no golden calf. Correct. And I was rereading the scripture where it says, because they thought Moses, they didn't know what happened to him, they all quickly fell back. Yeah. And here's Aaron, he collected the gold. And yet, when Moses does come back, he becomes the high priest. He's trying to get all that around, and yet Moses, they, I mean, is that because he came in and with those, with the Levites? Yes. So a couple of things went on. First of all, um, it's very clear, this, this is, a, this is a, a, a grave sin on his part. But then first of all, you have repentance. So Aaron does repentance. Um, now Aaron's the way Aaron's the way issues later on, but he does repent of this. But notice, Aaron is not a little bit of a Oh, okay. Um, Aaron's not what? Aaron is not a little bit of a Aaron dies and says, Aaron is everything. He sees it, right? And then he, Moses sees it. Moses, Moses sees it. Aaron didn't see it. Well, he sees it the first time, not the second time. Um, one the so there's these two different things that we get to the advantage. Um, but Aaron dies in the middle of the 40 years. Moses dies right before Joshua and the rest of them enter the promised land. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, Aaron, so there's repentance, but Aaron's going to go to the promised land. Um, and you also have Aaron is, he's wrong, but he's trying. Um, he's trying to get down, he's trying to do his best. He's trying to serve God, but he's doing it the wrong way. Uh, I was confused with Joshua and Aaron. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Joshua. So remember, Joshua the younger. Uh, jo Joshua is. Uh, Joshua's much, much younger. Aaron's both his older brother. Okay. Well, Aaron was Moses' right hand to perform the miracles, correct? Correct. And so. Speaking of the hand. Right. And speaking of and dropping the stick and it right. the sword and on. So, as such, does he, did he feel like when he was building that? Getting that cap together, that that was his power that God had given him because he was working with Moses as the, as the hand man. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 And that's what actually caused him to think, well, Moses isn't here anymore, so I need to generate something for these people. Well, I'm sure that that's why they go to him in the first place, right? Because right. he was the right. leader. He worked in the miracles of the Moses direction. He was he was a prophet to uh, Moses. So he was. He was Many ways a great man. Uh, he was his favorite son. But, you know, like St. Peter, <laughs> he definitely had his twist on his mouth, made mistakes, and did what makes sense. Right. Um, he was able to repent because right. God is still on his side. And, and so, what I would say is, Aaron, in many ways, is an example of St. Peter. You know, that, that, that first high priest, right. but weak. And the reason why you're given these these leaders for a week first because our strength doesn't lie in us, it lies in Christ. Both the machine has beautiful reflection. Where he says, if Satan John had been the first pope, we all would despair. 
we all would say, well, who could follow that? Who could do that? And Peter, the first pope, we can say, okay, well, that's not what one would make it. <laughs> I, Lord would take me too. And Aaron is a similar story. You know, this you know, clearly, you know, you know, we see Aaron other times, he is greedy, he is selfish, he is proud, yeah. he is um, human. Human. <laughs> <laughs> but he repents. And so he is sincere to say. Um, we don't want this other his feast day, but there is there is an official we don't know what it is, but there is an official feast day in the church in the day of Aaron. But I'm not sure exactly what it is. I put it up to one side of this. Is there Aaron the Saint? Uh, we don't know. Told the people saints, but he's a saint. He doesn't have it. Um, but, he, but like, like Tim Peter, who is very human, and he has made some very serious mistakes, which repented of and um, yeah, came back to God. But sin bravely in this, this case. Yes. <laughs> It would have been a much nicer story if the Darian stayed strong and said, No, stay back to God. Don't ever believe God. And I'd be the street man, okay, well, I guess you want me to. <laughs> and this honestly is a problem today that any priests and bishops have. You know, people want these things, people don't want to get mad about things done a certain way, and bishops and priests are afraid to stand up for God and say, well, Okay, well, the people want it this way, you want it this way. And so I'm not, I'm not going to teach on these things that people get mad. I'm not going to say these things that people get upset. People will leave if I, if I do it this way. So I'm going to do it, you know. It's, you it's, might even go up the rank to like cardinal on that one. <laughs> at times, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and so unfortunately, like many things, the golden calf has more to play. Uh, on to the next step. <laughs> Arrival at the promised land. So they spent some time at Mount Sinai, they didn't recover, they didn't get the law, they lived it for some time. It's not exactly how much time, but about a year. They spend living, learning, learning how to live this new way, learning their life. And then after a year, they could. Of being on Mount Sinai, talking with God, seeing um, Moses. Uh, well, one thing that happens too is this we see as part of this time with God. Moses then apparently goes to worship God. We see the space of the silhouette. After the after, after, after they reject God's the camp, then comes this, um, this Moses being with God becomes so great, his face begins to shine more. He has to hide his face from the people. It happens after the show. Um, but they spend out the time there, learning who God is, and they arrive at the promised land. So they've been about a year and a half out of Egypt. They come to the promised land. Okay, if we're settled, we're good. You know, so it took some time. We had to learn who God is, the covenant. And now, after only a year and a half of being away, we come to the promised land. Oh, wait, what happened? Four years. A year and a half. Moses begins by sending out 12 spies. It's 12 men, one from each tribe. Um, and, this, and Numbers 13 does name all of them. Only two are become important. And this is Caleb, the tribe of Judah, and Joshua, who we also call Moshe. Hoshea means salvation. And his name is changed to Joshua, which is God saves, or God is salvation. So they are separate names, not just. They are separate names, but they're definitely related. Mm -hmm. um, so Yahshua is pointed to God. This is just salvation. This is God is salvation. So this is this is a this, this clarifies who, who saved us. <laughs> um, and Joshua is the same name as Jesus. Uh, it's, it's Joshua, the Hebrew version of Jesus, the Latinized version, but is the same name as Jesus. Um, 
question about that. Yeah. I know that it's streaming, but how does it work with that that's the name above every other name when it is like fully common? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. That was a question. Um, every sound, every, it's not the sound that makes it the name of our name. It's who it belongs to. Um, it, it's, it's who you're referring to, who it means. The name of every other name isn't just the sound of Jesus. It is the name. God's name. It is Yahweh. God's being. Jesus has a name by the other name. is given a name by the other name. But it's saying is he is God himself. Jesus Christ shares in this name. Has this name. And so when we say this name, we now mean this name. So it's, it's not it's not that the, the reason why this name is no other name is because of this name. You're not, you're not Very much like the whole a rose by any other name is would still be just as re, it's referring to the essence of who he is versus just correct the words associated correct. with it. Correct. Um, he is the one Jesus, right? Yes. One. Yes. Yes. Um, it's a little like asking, how can Jesus be the only mediator between God and man? If we all can mediate between, between God and man. Now, all of us can pray to God. All of us should receive on behalf of God. Moses intercedes on behalf. Um, but Jesus is the main mediator, and all of us can only mediate because of Jesus. Jesus has the name. Um, but it's not because of this name. It's not because of these vowels. It's because he shares in the essence of God and is God himself. And so this human name takes on honor and glory because of his divine nature. So they could have named him anything and it still would have applied. Yes and no. Um, yes in the sense that... They had to name him something. They had to name him something. <laughs> no in the sense that... His name reveals his mission. Hmm. His name reveals who he is. Um, and so that Old Testament, whenever it says, give me your salvation, what it's saying literally is give me Jesus. Hmm. Uh, what it says, I long for salvation. God is the one who saves us. What it's saying is Jesus is coming. So is it a name or is it a phrase? What is it? Yes. <laughs> Hebrew names are often phrases. Right? So my name means my Nathan. <laughs> means gift of God. That name or a phrase? Yes. <laughs> Michael means who is like God. Raphael means hero of God. Gabriel means strength or strong man of God. And, and, and their names reveal who they are. So Michael is the one who, who speaks out against the devil and his evil. So there's only one God. Who is like God? Who is like God? And Michael is going to stand against that, that line. That there's anyone like God. Gabriel is the strength of God because he points to the strength of God, Jesus Christ. The strong man of God, the man of God. Raphael is God's healer. He's the healer of God. He is the one who brings healing and truth, especially in marriages and, yes, and with, with COVID-19. Is Gabriel also like the voice of God because he brings this or the messenger of God? Well, angel is actually the messenger of God. Oh, angel is the messenger of God. But Gabriel, the word Gabriel means strength or strong man okay. of God. Because he's pointing to the strength, the strong man. Right, so uh, if you look at, at I forget the, which, which book it is, the, the, which gospel is, but over to the parable where he says um, when a strong man um, has a treasure and has armor, can't be overcome with a strong man, he takes away the armor and beats him. That's the devil and Jesus. The strong man is the devil. The strong man is Jesus Christ, who beats him overcome and takes away the armor. And what, okay. what was Michael? Um, who is, who, 
who is like God. Me is the worker. Mikaya. Um, uh, me is, is who in, in Hebrew. Kai is like or as. And El is God. Mikaya. Bakane. Gift of God. Uh, Nathan is the Lord's Lord gift. Um, God and Adam. So these, these are phrases, but they also point to the mission. Uh, Abraham is father of nations. Is that a phrase or a name? Yes. Um, because he, Hebrew names do for the name of the person and also, also phrase. But again, if you look at the Old Testament, wherever it says, you are my salvation, I offer salvation, this is Basically pointing towards Jesus. So could it be that other name? Sure. There's nothing intrinsic about this name. But there is something about his mission which this name signifies and describes. So, so feeling all that, but did people have nicknames? Is this something that's a, an artifact of the way it was written or spoken of back then versus the names they would have actually gone by? Um, the ordinary person certainly had nicknames. And we see this in the gospel where Jesus calls James and John the sons of thunder. The thunders, because they're tenors. Um, so the, or the ordinary, yes. But in terms of the scripture, the scripture's not going to call by nickname. The scripture's going to refer to the mission and to the name uh, that God gives. Um, so Simon Peter is called the rock. Um, you know, that's not a nickname. That That's a mission, a title. Um, but in ordinary life, I'm sure people have nicknames, so that's human nature. It's too often to say all these things, <laughs> you know, um, especially friends and family, you know, just human nature, you know. So I, I was called that. I was not, I was not I was always called gift of God. <laughs> <laughs> Especially by your siblings, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some days my parents do. <laughs> Sometimes I was the cross, you know, they're from hell. They go, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so these, these 12 men are picked, and they go out <clears throat> and they look at the land, the promised land. They're there, they were wrong. And they go out and they bring back grapes, and they bring back <clears throat> produce, and they bring back things. Yes, everything God's promised us is here. Everything God's promised us is here. It is a land of honey. This is, this is a beautiful place. This is what we're looking for, long for a place to home, a place to God, and no God to be with God forever. But 10 of 12. <clears throat> Everyone except Caleb and Joshua look around and say, There's all these other people here. And they're powerful than we are, they're stronger than we are, they're bigger than we are. This is not worth it. They'll try. And they'll get go for every guy. And the other people, and they say, Yeah, um, actually, first they, they lie. And they, they, they tell Moses, it is a land formed by the honey, but no people. They tell everyone else, people, it is a bitter land full of thorns, but this soul is broken, and there are giants. This isn't even worth it. This isn't this is the promise. This isn't worth is anything. Let's run away. And it goes so far as that they say, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to slavery. Let's go point someone out beside him. Moses is an idiot. He's led us to this place to die. Let's get someone else to lead us, and we'll go back to Egypt. He comes to say to Pharaoh, we're sorry, make us your slaves again. <laughs> Caleb and Joshua stand up and say, wait a minute, we've seen God. You know what, we've seen God give us the manna every day. We've seen God's power, we've seen the Red Sea, we've seen the flood, we've seen, you know, all these miracles. Over and over and over again. What are you doing? God's on our side. We can take this is the promised land. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. they, they show forth uh, these um, a cluster of grapes. It's described as taking two men to care. Mm -hmm. So it's this giant 
cluster of grapes. That's awesome. They said, look, we have this. We got this. Trust us. And in response, they cried the stone. Joshua okay. oh. <clears throat> Again, <laughs> the story here is um, it's sad and terrible and also very human. Because, of course, we would never reject God if you see what he's done for us. We would never abandon God after he's done for us, would we? Of course not. All of those dumb people over there in the Testament. <laughs> and then God speaks. God's glory appears. And they're all cast out in confusion and terror. We see most of this in the Testament, in the Gospel of John, right? the, where the crowds come to arrest Jesus. Jesus says, I'm here in all of And then he says, I'm here to take me to heaven. Rather than, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this. You know, the spirit of boys and kind of things fall down and collapse. Maybe there's something more here than just than, than the ordinary. But they don't. They don't. And God says ten times to reject it. What's the, where we hit, we've seen that number ten before. Ten plagues. Right? Pharaoh rejects God ten times. And he loses his firstborn again. The people reject God ten times. And so what they lose then is the promised land. And he says, of all of you who come from Egypt, not one of you is the promised land. You know what? Well, even you ask. Except for Caleb and Josh. Everyone else is believing his wife. They're going to die in the desert. See, one of God's greatest punishments to sinners is giving us what we ask for. Sometimes the greatest punishment is the Lord answering our prayers. Or allowing us to choose to take the one. The thing is, it's very true. The Lord will let us reject. Well, let us seek wealth, and power, and fame, and money, and sex, and fill the money. And we'll get those things. We're going to get this right. The Lord will answer our prayers. Those who seek will find. Those who knock will be at the open. And these people have rejected the promised land, reject God. And God says, okay. You don't want the promised land? I'm not going to give you the promise. But he still feeds them. He still with them. He still walks with them. He still their God. And so the thing is here, we, we both have a horrible warning and a sign of God's mercy. Horrible warning because there is this warning again. If you, if you ask for it, again, you're seeking fame and power and pleasure. You might get that. You're going to be miserable when you have it. It's without God. You might get a grasp. But the Lord is always merciful, is always good, is always seeking. And it's quite possible that some of those people, and Moses and Aaron, for instance, but possibly some of other people as well, if they repent and came back to God in their old age, turn for a more percent. Because the wandering in the desert is simply the Lord saying, I'll destroy you and kill you and you die. They're only being cut off from the earthly box line. Now, if they stay in the rebellion, stay in rejection of God, well, yeah, it's different. It's all in heaven, too. Mm -hmm. um, but if they had repent and come back to God and reject, reject their own God, then the land is the heaven comes, which is the real land. And so the Lord, okay, they're in a water in 40 years. And so their life becomes much harder, their own choice, was much more, more, more weak. We also have here then this, this recognition that God chooses people who aren't the bravest, the best, or the strongest. But God chooses us. God chooses us. And he has Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua don't succeed. Right? But they try to convince them to trust God, to follow God. I'm sure this looks like they failed. Right? 
They're forced to that for 40 years. They were ready. Moses was ready. Aaron made them. Talk to me about that. Who these Moses? And God even tells Moses, I'll just go all these people, reject me, I'll make you a nation. You have kids, I'll just put my way to give you gifts. Moses says, No, Lord, please, and that will. On the surface, it looks as though Joshua and Caleb fell. They come, they can't convince the people. They do end up on the desert and everybody else for 40 years. They don't, they don't end up in the promised land, but they're what, in the 60s. What was that? <laughs> 60 was different back then. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Neophones, Neophones, Osmonds, Neophones, Nephilim. Nephilim. How do you say it? Nephilim. Nephilim. Osmonds. What about them? That is that who they refer to as now? Uh, now they have fallen? Um, so Nephilim, there are several theories about that. That doesn't appear. That's the fourth flood. Uh, and so there are a couple of well, numbers. That was, was Noah's Ark. That was the that was cross our, between the yeah. demons and the. Well, there's two different theories. Um, right. and, and so it may have been from Cain, it may have been something more supernatural. It may, it may have been the uh, simply the, the heroes for pagans. Uh, there's a few different theories about it. Right. Um, how Greek mythology came into play in the heart. Right. Yeah. right. But, but, but that's, yeah. that's, that, that, that's pre. It's pretty important to find. And they know these things. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so, so these are, uh, yeah. Um, it looks like Aaron and Moses and Joshua and Philip will fail. Because mine's coming up in 1333 here. 1333? Yeah, Numbers 1333. Um, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the context? 13. The reference to the fallen heroes of old. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are they, we saw the, Nephos. The Nephos are the are from from Nephos. Our own eyes have seen them like grasshoppers. And okay, so I see. I've seen, seen them. Yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. Anak? Yeah. This is a Yeah, yeah. So this is referring to a particular race called the Anaki. So. The people who lived in the area were taller, were stronger, and were seen as descendants from the Nephilim. Okay. Uh, so, so I thought I'd like to listen to the people again. Um, so, 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 yes. So, the uh, the, the people who lived in, in, the, in the area, lived in Canaan at the time, were taller and stronger and seen as descendants and were seen as the descendants <coughs> of the, these. And that's what they had to go against. Yes. So, they okay. resembled them to these people, or? It was, believed, it, was, it was believed at least that, that, that they were their descendants. And so, what the people, what the parents are saying is that they're too powerful for us. Mm-hmm. And Joshua and Henry are saying, no, we have God on our side. We have a much more powerful being on our side. And they're saying, oh, no, it's the, they're, 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 they're the son of, of these Nephilim. They're giants, they're bigger than us, they're stronger than us. We can't do anything as the thieves, and this, and they're stupid and we try. And Joshua and Caleb are saying, wait a minute. What have you been seeing on the land last year? Where have you guys been? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? We just saw them destroy the God of Egypt. We saw them get rid of the people destroy the Egyptians. We were slaves. We saw what happened, you know, with the Red Sea. We saw all these things. We have God on our side. That's when Joshua becomes God of salvation. Not simply salvation, but God of salvation. He's in their mind with us. Um, But the fact is, even though it looks like Joshua and Caleb failed, they don't, they don't, they don't fail. Because they do end up going with the promised land, they do end up leading the people uh, being saved. They do end up, but they do it now in obedience from God, they're doing it in a, in a different way. Well, to me, this reminds me of the first, sorry, first Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 26 to 30. Um, 
where Paul is talking to the first Christian, he says this. Consider your call, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to the standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of other birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Right? According to the worldly wisdom, these people could have been more powerful, stronger, bigger. <coughs> but Caleb and Joshua were right. They're the ones who do it, who are, that they're the real saviors of the people. God chose what is lower despised in the world, even things that are not, but not the things at all. So no human being might boast the presence of God. Because our strength, our power, our, our authority, our goodness comes not from us, not from who our parents are, not from how big we are, how smart and rich we are, not God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God has better wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as is written, on the hill boasts, boasts the Lord. And so the thing is, every one of us can boast of the Lord. Every one of us can say, I am God on my side. Unless you reject that. Hopefully, hopefully you can say, I'm God on my side. <laughs> hopefully you can say, I'm following the Lord in this world. And if that's the case, nothing to be afraid of. No one can stand against us, and we can't recall his life. And after this for 40 years, the evidence perfect, and therefore reject that again. Right? <laughs> no. It's different. It's different. Human. Human. Yeah. Um, it's cross of purification. It's also purified by individual heart, but also the whole people. And unfortunately, it's not easier to destroy something than it is to, to heal something. It's easier to ruin something than it is to build something. Destruction takes them all. <coughs> Building takes life. Um, right, because building is created, and only God can do it. Destruction, things by nature are God. So can destroy, I can destroy the Mona Lisa, I can destroy you know, the city of Not the problem. I can't paint it. <laughs> <laughs> so, a little while goes by, then comes a rebellion of Korah and the Levites. So Korah, also called Korah sometimes, again this is an English translation of the Hebrew name, Korah is a Levite, meaning the lowest of the three orders. He's, he's, he's the lowest of the three orders. Um, the equivalent of the deacon. And he's basically, and he has come to conspiracy with two other people, two men, the families, Dathan and Abba. How do you say that? How do they say that? Abraham or Abraham? Abraham? Um, who are both who try to ruin them. And Korah is saying basically, so wait a minute, I want to be a priest too. I want to offer sacrifice too. Moses, when you're talking about, I want to be and David and Abraham and the family say, yeah, that sounds good to us too. We're going to do it our way, we're going to sacrifice our own way, we're going to, we're going to do our own thing. Who, who are you? The thing that, 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 that it said here is we have a warning here to the Levite. A few months before this, he was say for the old path. He had rejected, and now he sees at a point where he's saying, you know what, no. I'm as good, I'm as far as they are, I'm as good as they are, I can do this too. What's different about me is I'm not as good as that. How dare you tell me that that call comes from God, not myself? He was faithful before. <coughs> and now I'm the best. You can, you can never be a point where you say, I'm perfect, I've done it all. You know, there's nothing more I have to learn. He says to Moses, you've gone too far. You know, with these divisions, with these television, who could serve God in what way. Every one of us is holy. The Lord's among them. Well, who are you to exalt yourself above the assembly? 
from God's people, who don't belong to God, we're all a holy nation. Why do you why not any one of us be priests? Then any one of us serve God. Who are you as established seasons and the times, feast days, and the law of happiness? We're all God's people. Who are you? God's chosen one is represented as the prophet. And Moses begs him to repent. He says, Turn back to me, reject this, and you will be rebelling against God. Because he says, Please, we'll come back to us. They go out of the red sense, they go out for sacrifice, you know, we're going to go away. He says, Those who repent, come here. They say, No. He says, The earth's going to swallow you up. He goes, Cool. And it does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I, yeah. Um, and again, you, you would think, you know, just, again, it's, it's not that Moses is out there, you know, trying to zap people, trying to hurt people, just like, ha, ha, I've got you now. <laughs> he begs them to repent, to turn back, to change their minds, or to, to stop doing these things. And the first thing we're being told that is the evil of doing that wrong way, it's still path over it, is so strong. That death is better. It's better to die than to reject God. It's better to die than to try to exalt yourself over God. And they're given a chance to repent. You know, you, you, would, you would think that if Moses comes to you and says, if you don't repent, you're going to be killed, you would think they would say, you know what, maybe you don't just talk about And only a pure fear, you would say, you know what, okay. I'm not going to do this. That's not something I'm talk later on. But you, you would think, you know, that, that they would say, oh, well, 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 well. <laughs> did, did, did Satan have influence in what was these things that were going on at that sure. time? I mean, yeah. so, because they seemed like they were God fearing, pure people, and then all of a sudden they're affected by something. Yeah. Satan always, so there's always three sources. Of, of temptation. There's the world, where they're hanging out with these people and talking to them. You know, I imagine, you know, this this is imagination, you can take this as well, either. You know, these, these are dream mice. Hanging together and saying, you know what? I don't think it's fair. Right, it's not fair. You know what we should do? We should go, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> you know, they're encouraging each other, they're hanging out, and they're, they're, they're boosting, but this is when they're holding their mouths together. And they, you know, who are you? Yeah, who are you? You know, it's kind of what you actually get. Now, if they were by themselves, they probably would have done that. But they talk to each other and hey, hang their moments and peer mentality, peer pressure. Peer pressure, and, mm -hmm. you know. And there's also pride on the inside, so the world and the flesh. You know, there's obviously a, a proud man. So you guys want to serve God, but that God of our world may believe him. And now he said, well, well, I'm a leader. I was picked by God. I was, I am this, I am that, I am the big deal. I'm as good as Moses. I can do this. And of course the devil's involved to whisper in their ears as well. So where are the three sources of evil? Three sources of temptation. Of temptation. Sin is always in the world. So three sources of temptation. The world, mm -hmm. person, places, and things that makes it easy to attract it. The flesh, our own human weakness, and the devil. These quality of the spirits who tap us and try to stir emotions, stir up things in our hearts and souls, makes it, make it easy to fall. All the flesh and the devil. Um, and these are always remain. And so Christ was tempted by the world, the devil, and not the flesh. Christ was the head of the Lord himself. So St. Peter, for instance, tells us the back cross. The devil was the back cross. But we have the original sin to the Lord inside as well. That's what the devil made me do it. Well, the devil tempts us to do it. No, I'm just saying, yes. like if Roman Martin was laughing. Yeah. 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 Y
I don't know the old TV show, and this was a catchphrase, but I don't know the comics. TV, where's that? But as long as you all get it, you all get it. <laughs> 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 when I was your age. <laughs> so, the elements of love and destroy. Um, now, pause, think that they flesh about us. I just wanted to know that uh, if you've ever been read it, probably. Um, Speak to the community. Uh, Moses is supposed to speak to the community and tell them to withdraw from the space around the dwelling of Korah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm not supposed to do it, pronouncing. Um, so stand up, you know, yes. Normally, swallowed up. Normally, the people who aren't following them step back. Yes. And so he warned the community to keep away from the tents of these wicked men and do not touch anything that is theirs. Otherwise, you too will be swept away because all because of all their sins. Yeah, but it's a, it's a warning. It's not just a business. Right, it's a warning. And then he it says he opens up the ground and all the family and anything to do with those people yep. is destroyed. It yeah. all goes down and gets swallowed up, and then the ground closes above it. Yep. Well, it even says again, right? Yeah, and it even says. The little ones. Yeah. Well, it's their babies. Um, they didn't do anything wrong there. But he took away their their lineage, right? Yeah. So a couple things. So a couple things. So two hundred and fifty families. Remember, you had here. First of all, you had choices. Right, Moses doesn't have right. Moses tells people, leave. Mm -hmm. Any one of their wives, children could have said, you know what, I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know where this is going. Mm -hmm. Moses tells them where it's going. You know, if your husband was being a jerk, Moses says, you know, step back, you're going to be swallowed up. You, you might say, you know what, honey, you need to do what you want. I'm, I'm that guy. <laughs> the wives don't. So, the family stick with it. And that, that's so that they've sent. The children, the infants, those who can't choose, they're not going to hell. They're not being condemned to that nation. Um, they are, uh, they receive punishment from their parents. The thing is, human will, we back up. Human beings are made by God to share his faith and share his work. And this is so true, so real, that what we do in this life will affect not just myself, but those around us. So if I, as a priest, step up the thought of the preach heresy, that will affect not just me. That will affect you and your children and children's children until someone figures it out. All, most of the great, the great heresies, I use that term, we're talking about the priests and bishops. If you look at you know, a little bit of history, most of them weren't. Most of them are leaders, most of them are priests, bishops, who decided that they did. And the best ones that established today were not by priests, by bishops. Who affect not just themselves, the children, the children, the children, who's listening. The effect each other. You know, if you were parents with kids, you can mess your kids up. You can do this to each other all the time. Because you can also build and strengthen and, and lead them and heal them, and make them saints or to the the path. The Lord truly wants to make us his children. Part of what our nature is to share is work to do his will and to love. And this means we also have a real chance to mess with them. <coughs> By ending the evil with this line, the Lord prevents the evil from spreading. The children don't go to hell. They get an earthly punishment only through their parents. Whether it is on a parent or just, they're going to be saved or not. 
This is the Lord's way of saving them from further evil. Okay. Right? So remember, in Greek and in Hebrew, there's different terms for the place of the dead. And the place of the damned, which is the heaven. He doesn't want to have it. We said that Christ is the creed, right? Christ is handed into hell. Mm-hmm. We don't mean the place of the devil is the place of death. We mean is the place of the dead, which is in, and more specifically, the place of the, of the just who have died. And so the infants who are just go, go to Sheol with both well, not Moses, but with Noah and Adam and the Eve, uh, when they would wake Christ. They're safe. But it says that they were taken down to the nether world. Yes, so Sheol. So not not hell. Um, For them. Not hell in the, in the sense of place of death. Like, because hell just can mean Sheol or hell. So, so Gehenna is Sheol, is the place of the dead, and Gehenna is the place, place of the dead. The dead. And they also refer to it as uh, the abyss. The abyss. Yeah. So, so I think that that's a cautionary way of reading is confusing language with our own exposure to it, assuming that the netherworld implies something that's not written or something that may have been written differently in the past. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it simply means the world will because. They literally write them up. What about the, things, um, the sins of the oh. father? Mm-hmm. Or carry on the sins of your father? Yeah. Uh, um, and so not spiritual, but physical. Oh, right. Just, okay. Right. And, and, okay. That, and that happens. Right. I mean, the Lord's clear out so the your mind. He's clear it's not going to affect your guilt, but it does affect you in reality. Sure. Right. I mean, if your father's a drunken boss who will abandon you and abandon you and your mother, that's going to affect you. Probably your kids, maybe your marriages. Mm-hmm. It's not going to affect your, your free will, it's not going to affect your willingness. Got it. Unless you all choose that. It is going to affect you. Got it. Okay. Oh. And certainly, you know, on the other side, the Lord says, I'll remember the, 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 the love and the justice and the fidelity for a thousand years. As well as where it says, um, that the Lord has chosen you and love for your folks. Because Abraham and Isaac, Jacob were faithful, the Lord chose you and loved them. But they were saying that their saying that their prayers affect you and you today. And in a more deeper way than evil does. So evil affects down the fourth generation, good affects down the balance. It doesn't change even the spiral of yours. So we can repent those sins. Yes, absolutely. Because part of doing a good confession is repenting the sins of your father prior to. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of guilt, we don't carry on guilt uh, in the sense of um, having our special case, new case, complicated, going to it as well. Uh, but in most cases, uh, that refers to guilt for the friendship of God. I can't, I can affect you, I can make it easy for you, I can inform you falsely, but I can't make you so. I can make it easier for you if I say, oh, yeah, you know, go ahead and get going. That's fine. Or go ahead and get us a second wife. I don't care. That's Old Testament stuff. If you want to get have a second or third wife, that's fine. Okay. You know, and, and people preach that. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's trying to make it easier to sin, but one cause of sin. Right. It would certainly make it hard for you to do the right thing if I'm telling you, oh, yeah, go ahead and do this with you. Well, if but you're not grown up seeing stuff and you don't know that it's a sin and you continue to do it and you find out later, that's how you can confess it. Right. Once right. you carry it down from the fathers, your forefathers to come out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the things you do affect each other. Yeah. Look. Uh, did that answer your question too, Mike? Your question oh, about jail? Yeah. Okay. Um, what's beautiful here to me also is that there's either a value here, 
but people are kind of shocked, okay. But Moses says, you know what? Let's double check this, make sure this is the Lord's way. And he says, choose leaders from everyone in your tribes. And we're going to pick like, the ten rods and stuff. We're going to put all these twelve staffs into the right name of your leader uh, on the rod to put it in the Ark of the Covenant. Or put it in the sorry, put it in the uh, in the, in the, in the temple tabernacle before God, and the Lord will show us who he should <clears throat> The tribe of Levi calls for Aaron to the They just there's twelve, there's twelve dead sticks. One of the rods blossoms and grows flowers. It's a it's a it's a dead stick. Go for night and blossoms and grows flowers. This, by the way, is often is the reason why Joseph. Is shown here in Gilgis. It's a reference back to Aaron, his priesthood, that he was chosen by God to be the foster father of the Lord. That's the purity of also the reference back to choosing Aaron. Um, so Aaron's rod walked the flowers, and then this rod was placed on the side of God's uh, choosing him, God's loving him, and God's uh, will is placed in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant carries a map, the tablets of the law, and Aaron's staff of law songs. God's choice. Um, and so we see there that then God chooses who wants to serve. And this is so true that we see this in the book of Hebrews, where it says, not even Jesus appointed himself as priest. God appointed. Hebrews chapter 5. Every high priest chosen of Rome among men is appointed for the act of half men for God. Why well, does not take the honor upon himself, Torah, <laughs> but is called by God as his Aaron was. So there's several lessons we get from this story. And the first is that the servant of God, again, you see here is lesson that that's reflected the entire time of the desert, is God is meant to be in charge. And we want to try to love God and serve God in God as we want. It is a very common temptation for people to say, I'm going to serve God according to my desires, my lights, my wishes, my plan. Because surely I'm the best. And we're called to conform ourselves to God, to his will, to his truth, to who he is. Otherwise, we have to be focused upon ourselves and serve ourselves. The second thing we see here is Aaron's rod, this blossoming rod, points to the cross. Christ is the, the priest for excellence because of the sacrifice of the cross. And just as this dead wood blossomed and gave flowers, gave life, the dead wood of the cross from Christ's sacrifice and Christ's priesthood gives life. The form of sacrifice, the form of life, the form of, of grace, the place, the source, the fountain of eternal life. And so this blossoming rod is a place in the Ark of the Covenant. Is this image, symbol, and sign of the crucifixion? And you also have here that one of us we're going to hear is that human authority, temporal authority, government, and spiritual authority, even though they're different, spent most now are different people, have the same goal and the same purpose. God also sets up physical you know, human authority. He tells upon his pilot. We only have authority because God gave it to you. We have no authority to become people of God. Peter tells the Christians, serve the emperor. We are appointed by God. So the same source of power should have the same goal. And all too often, especially in this day and age, want to be different goals. Want to be different purposes. And even true human authorities have the same goal. The same purpose, the same plan, yeah. leading us to eternal life in heaven and salvation. All comes from God, all lead to God, <coughs> and all should be about God. Different authority, different places, different roles, but all with the same purpose. So, should we be following human authority because it is granted by God, even though we know in our hearts it's wrong? So we follow human authority to the extent where it's not. So in the words of St. Thomas More, I die the king's good servant, 
with God's voice. Um, and so where the human authority is held in authority, is held in something that's neutral or correct. This happens if it's, you know, uh, the speed limits, you know, that, that's neutral. Well, like even look at the angle, about, you know, not never the guns are on and, the, you know, bow down to him or whatever, and he said, no, Darian is the same thing. So um, he wasn't serving the king. He was serving the king in what he asked him to do, but when it came to God, he didn't. And so where the human authority is neutral or could it be you know, obey them? Where they give us evil commands, we must not obey them because we, we, we follow God first. Human authority is only given to man for the sake of leading us to God. So it's it's only kind of differs from that. It differs from that that they have no authority. Uh, so no human being can order us to sin and command us to wickedness. When they do, we must oppose them because we are God's followers first. Um, and so this is why our Lord says, um, you know, the tribe of Pharisees are taken with the same Moses. He wants to do all things as well, but they tell him. We don't want to take that. So the words, don't do evil. Don't, don't say God. But where it comes to customs, it comes to fasting, it comes to prayers, they have the authority. You know, so if, if there is a bishop who would give commands or a pope who commands, as long as it's not sinful, you have to obey. Even if it's stupid, you have to obey. If it becomes sinful, if it becomes wrong, you must not obey. Whether that's parents, whether it's government, whether it's a bishop, pope, priest, human authority must obey as long as it's neutral or good. Even if it's silly or foolish. But if it becomes evil, if it becomes wrong, if it's against God's will, you must not. Can I ask you a question now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can step right into it. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there's uh, been a uh, men's conference in Phoenix for the past you know, spring, February, March, whatever it was. Okay. You know, Bill used to take the boys, and so Jeremy's still going. He took his son, and um, as you know, Bishop Olmsted retired. Right. And so um, we've held uh, assigned uh, Bishop John Dolan from San Diego. He was auxiliary bishop down, down there for um, uh, uh, Missouri. Anyway, he requested that they would all stand during the consecration. I said, "There's no way I would do that." That's and I don't. I only talk about the like the 24 different rites and all the movements, mm -hmm. including what the Christians should be doing or not. But that's against my will, desire. I'm not going to disrespect that. Yeah. Uh, so, this is one of those things where human authority mm -hmm. And so the bishops, or we go so far. We were saying, I remember a blue in the governor of the very to be. You can't deny that. Mm -hmm. If you were to say you need to only buy Papa John's pizza, well, that's, you have no authority over that. And when it comes to these private devotions, it comes to these private he even comes to mass, mm -hmm. he has no authority over that. Okay. Um, and so this is one of those things where one could, without sin, choose to obey. Um, but when one would choose not to listen because the authority of the bishop does not extend that far. And in this case, this command is a foolish one because it was a road to faith in Christ. What was the reason for him wanting them to stand? He's from Southern California, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> There is an idea of certain areas and certain people that's, that does have roots in truth, but makes no sense in reality. And the, uh, there were certain time and places where it was a sign of sorrow and standing was a sign of joy. And certain cultures, certain places, even the Eastern Rite, uh, they stand for consecration, the sign of the resurrection and the joy. But it's not our culture. It's not this place, not this time. And so kneeling is the sign of love and reverence veneration. Standing is right. Um, and so to try to, but the reason why is because some people say, well, kneeling is a sign of sorrow and repentance. And so this is the place of resurrection. The problem with commanding that is you're trying to impose an idea that's not. Now, now, 
that it's outside our own to come from the culture from the inside and trying to teach you play with, with ritual and the mass and the degree. So he really doesn't have authority to no. have you do that. It, would no. it be the no. same as the priests who are refusing to give people um, yeah. Eucharist when they kneel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if somebody I want to bite bite that choose to do it, I don't think it would be something. Because No, I would yeah. just I would just say that's your sin, not mine. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And then, so if someone chooses to stand in front of the grave, it's not sinful. But he also think if someone, if someone said, Mark, listen to you, this is stupid. This one's fine. Um, because this was beyond the bishop's authority. The bishop had no authority to say that. That's, that's what the bishops had authority to command them to a mass. Um, they recommend it, they suggest it, they ask for it, but they can't command it. How would the layperson know this? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that he stands for the gospel, that seems to be focused attention right. to the gospel. Maybe it's the gospel used to be read at sitting down. They did, in the synagogue and stuff, everybody sat, shortly did, or they read the wrong, or they read the gospels and things like that. It was all sitting. Yes, yes. yes. Because because the general, there's nothing wrong with anybody. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with anybody in the posture. It's the heart of me, right? Right. right. If it was your culture standing on one foot, it's not a reference. It's standing on one foot. But don't make, don't make it up. Don't, don't, don't say that everybody has a bad idea. I think it's all standing on one foot as a sign of balance, for balance and balance, and a sign of a perpetual life that everybody has to rely upon. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I can accept that. I, I can accept that. I can accept that. I can accept that. Um, but you know, again, I can say that, I can teach that, mm-hmm. and I can probably confuse the heck out of everybody. And I can probably make other people in the church by doing this. That's the heavy, heavy people on But But liturgy doesn't come from me. And so the problem with doing that is liturgy be about us, mm-hmm. as opposed to performing ourselves to something. Um, and, but, Answer to Daniel's question, the average person probably not to know this, and that's why I, I would say the person doing it who's not, not the priest or bishop is probably not the same. But by the way, they're trying not to, to, to be obedient. Well, wouldn't it be as but, long as we're going through the regular order of the Mass that we know we would be doing it, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, but one of the scary things about having authority is people listen. Um, well, I have one one priest that told me when he raised the Eucharist that I should bow down in reverence, mm-hmm. and then I good. had and I had an, uh, another priest that insisted that you had to stare at it because we're given, you know, it's so wonderful. And I just decided, well, I'll respect the priest. So I I knew in my heart what I believe, but. I kind of did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, it's kind of like, okay, I'm staring at you. <laughs> because, you know. And, and that's one of those things where I would say it's neutral. But I would say to the couple of the priests with this, not um, because When it comes to the people, there should be room for personal devotion. Because you're trying to get your heart out. Not to the extent of your But I mean, I just, but, one, yeah. one priest yeah. told me I have, this is the way you should do it, and this is why. And then the other priest said, well, this is the way you should do it, and this is why. So I just thought, well, God knows what's in my heart. I'm yes. just going to respect the priest. And, and so uh, either way is fine as long as we're trying to love the middle of God. As soon as it becomes, this is cool, but this sounds like a good idea at the time, that's a problem. You know, because all, all things sound for good idea at the time. But the question is, is it following God and worshiping God? Um, you, say, you look at some of the 70s clothes and haircuts. <laughs> we thought it was great. We sat somewhere. No, unfortunately, there is regular confusion. Um, 
when it comes to, to being someone in the church, again, our desire has to be serving others. If someone according to his command will be listened to without disobedience, even if it's silly or stupid or, or just weird, we can like that. If it is something that is wrong and sinful, we shun that. If it's something that's beyond their authority and irrelevant, we can choose to listen on it as it is. And this is one of those things that I would just outside of this story to say. Um, and I would say on his, his part it's wrong. You know, but on the part of people listening, it would not be wrong. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh good. <laughs> uh, let's close with prayer. Let's look at the questions. Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, give us obedient listening hearts. To form our hearts the part of your Son. That all we do and say may be joined in his life, his cross and resurrection. May we be the servants here on earth and your saints in heaven. We all that we say and be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.